The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on your guard. Keep awake. For you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, good morning and welcome. You may be seated. My name is Matt Osterkamp, and it is really a delight to get to talk with you today about the things of our Lord. We are um, concluding a sermon series that we've been working our way through the Gospel of Mark over the summer and into the fall. Um, In this sermon, um, we are talking about Mark chapter 13. Now, Mark chapter 13 is a long teaching block of Jesus where he is talking to his disciples about the things that are to come. And while it is one long kind of uninterrupted series of teachings or lecture, we've decided to divide it into two parts. So last week, Father Aaron did the first half of the chapter verses 1 to 23. Um, And in that sermon, he talked about the emergency plan of the king. He talked about the postures of the faithful disciple in times of crisis. So if you weren't here for that last week, you can find that on the podcast stream, and I would encourage you to go back and check that out. Today, we are going to be picking up right in the middle in verse 24, and I'm going to be talking about verse 24 to the end. But I want to just take a moment to to reestablish the scene, to remind us of where we are in the story. It is Holy Week. It is Tuesday of Holy Week. We are three days before the crucifixion of Jesus. The time is drawing short. He's been in the temple, or he's been in Jerusalem and around the temple with his disciples during that day, and now it is in the afternoon. And they've had some heated confrontations. There's been some pointed parables about vineyard owners. And as, as they're kind of making their way out of the city, they're staying overnight in Bethany, out in the suburbs. Um, I think the, the disciples are reading the room and the, the conflict in the gospel between Christ and the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin, the political and intellectual leaders of that day, that conflict that's been present throughout is all coming to a boil. And as I read this passage, I get a sense that the crowds are really hanging in the balance. Will the crowds rally behind this relatively newcomer, this messianic figure from Galilee that they celebrated on Sunday? Or are they going to fall in line with the established leadership, with the hierarchy in Jerusalem? And I think the disciples, they're sensing this as they look around. I mean, how could they not be? And knowing that it was a tense day as they leave town, I think they want to win, end the day on a win. You know, have you ever been there? You've had a tough meeting or conversation, you're like, Let's just find one thing that we can agree on. Let's just, let's just end on a high note. And then maybe tomorrow we can come back and, you know, we can start a new, tr- new course, uh, chart a new course. So one of the disciples, we don't know which one, but we're going to say Peter. Father Aaron said it was Peter. He's going to tug on, on Jesus' sleeve as they're leaving town. And the crowds are still gathered around watching. The Pharisees and the scribes are watching, you know, seeing what's going to happen. He's, Jesus, look at this temple. I mean, isn't that cool, right, Jesus? Isn't this a pretty neat, look at those stones, they're so big. Let's just say something we can all celebrate. Let's just end on a high. But Jesus is here, and he doesn't need to be validated by the crowds. He's not intimidated by the the hierarchy. So he doesn't play along. He, He sees what Peter's doing, but he speaks truth in this moment. He says, you see that temple? You see all those stones? 
it's all going to be gone. Every one of those stones is going to be removed. It's just going to be flattened. It's not going to exist for much longer. At this point, I imagine a gasp from the crowd. You know, this is not what they would want to hear. And I imagine one of the disciples in the second or third row, maybe Philip or James, trying to get Peter's attention. Pete, Pete, knock it off. No more. This isn't helping. Just take the L and get out. We'll come back tomorrow. Let's not have him talk anymore. And I imagine the story that way because when I have experienced prophecy in the church, when the church wants to start talking about prophecy, when the Bible wants to start talking about the end times and the final judgment, when I'm reading and I get to Daniel or to Ezekiel or to Revelation, or when Jesus wants to talk about when he's going to come back, I've been that disciple who wants to say, Jesus, don't you know, we're just going to fight over this stuff. We're going to divide into teams. We're going to be pre-trib and post-trib and mid-trib and amillennial. It's going to be complicated. We're going to get upset. It's divisive. Let's just not talk about this. Let's talk about something else. Or I'm going to be Jesus. Okay, I, I get it. You said not to do this, but we're not going to be able to resist every headline. We're going to read as prophecy. We're going to tell the world you're coming back in 1844. We're going to tell the world, like, for reals this time, you're coming back in 1988. Jesus, when I'm in high school, we're going to put Saddam Hussein's picture on all these books in every bookstore and tell everybody he's the Antichrist and people are going to laugh. It's embarrassing. We're going to look dumb. I don't, I don't want to look dumb. Let's just not talk about this. Let's talk about something else. Or if I'm really being honest, I want to say, Jesus, this is really scary. I can't really get my head around the end of the world. I don't know what that would be like. You talk about persecution. You talk about tribulation. I want to be faithful. I, think, I hope I would be. I don't know if I would be faithful. And I want to be with you and your father and your kingdom. I don't want to be left behind. I don't want those I care about to be left behind. I get it. It's important, but not today. Can we just not talk about this? Can we talk about something else? So if you're here today and you heard the text or you knew what you were getting into or maybe you didn't and you showed up, you know, like prophecy, like for most of my a Christian life, I've, I've tried to avoid it. But in the last few years, and particularly last year, when I was uh, asked to lead a study on Matthew, I've started to think more and more about why is this here? Why is this important? And I've been feeling convicted that I've been missing out by wanting to avoid, by shoving it to the side, that Jesus has something for me. I think Jesus has something for the church collectively. I think we've kind of overcorrected as a church. See, when I was young, we talked, there was a lot of talk about prophecy. And, and I think in later years, at least in the churches I've been around, there's been less and less talk about that. I think that's been to our detriment. So Jesus and the disciples, we don't know if he says any more in Jerusalem. They get outside of Jerusalem. They go up the mountain. They're looking down at the city. And some of the disciples who are bolder than I would have been come up to Jesus and just, aren't we all thankful for people who don't have the same hangups that we have? Like, the world needs that. They come up and they say, Jesus, were you serious about that temple? Like, really? That's, that's going to happen? Like, when? How? And that's really what gets us into the Olivet Discourse. And Jesus, knowing there are hours left in his life, takes the time to say, I need, let's sit down. We need to talk about this. Mark, who has mostly not written about the teaching of Jesus, says, I want to take an extended portion of my book and talk about this. I think they're telling us this is important. We need to listen to this. They have things. Jesus has things he wants his first century disciples to understand from this teaching. I think there are things for his 21st century disciples to understand. So as we look at the words, let's think about that. What, what does he want? Why does he want people to hear this? What does he want us to get out of it? And I'm going to try to try to, you know, draw our attention to three three big points that I want to make and here they are. The first thing I think Jesus wants us to know is things are going to end. Things are going to end. The second thing I think he wants us to know is I'm going to win. I'm going to win. The third thing I think he wants us to know is be prepared. You need to be prepared. So let's turn in our scriptures to Mark chapter 13. Verses 24 and 25, um, you can find this in your program or in your Bible. I'm going to read 24 and 25, and then I'm going to jump down to verse 31. So 24 says, 
But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then verse 31, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. In the preceding verses, Christ has predicted that there will be war and there will be persecution. There will be animosity at, at a big scale. There will be animosity at an intimate scale where family member will turn on family member. He talks about the need to stand firm. He tells that it's going to get so bad that you're just going to have to flee. That there's going to be nothing left to do but just run and pray that it's not winter. Pray that you're not pregnant or ill so that you can get out. And having predicted all of those things here, I think he wants to summarize that. He wants to underscore that in some of the most dramatic language that he could bring to bear to tell his disciples that they are living in times of profound change. They're living in times when things are going to end, things they value, things that they can't imagine ending, that these are the end times. These are the times when things end. The language here, while it may, it, it is striking language, um, I think the disciples may have, refer, may have understood that it was an echo of a prophecy in Isaiah. In Isaiah 13, 10, we read these words, Indeed, the stars of the sky and its constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark when it rises, and the moon will not shine. Now, in context of Isaiah 13, he is making a prophecy not about Jerusalem, but about the city of Babylon, which in 539 would fall to the Medes and the Persians in a rather sudden um, takeover. The Medes and the Persians would come in the great Babylonian empire with the hanging gardens and all of its glory would kind of collapse in on itself and a whole new empire would arise. Now, I think you could stop here and just think about Christ using this language to connect Jerusalem and Babylon. And that's probably a whole sermon and that's not the sermon I'm going to preach, but um, it's an interesting point. Now, unless you think this is just an ancient practice of talking about inflection points in history in kind of grand cosmological terms, I would call your attention to a more recent text. Um, has anybody seen the musical Hamilton? Um, you may recall in that musical at the Battle of Yorktown, this is the final big battle of the American Revolution. It's when the French show up. It's when the immigrants get things done. That what is the chorus that they sing? What's the refrain? The world turned upside down, right? The world turned upside down. And I think they didn't literally mean, I don't even know what literally that would mean, but what they meant was this is changing everything. This upstart band of colonists has just defeated, defeated this global imperial power with their Republican government, with their democratic ideals, like history is going to be different after this moment. I think Jesus wants to underscore that a change is coming, that's going to be, history is going to be different after this moment. Now, the, the fall of Jerusalem, it happens off screen in the New Testament, so we maybe don't think a lot about it. And in, in, in history, all of these tragedies kind of get flattened a little bit. But it was a really big deal, the fall of Jerusalem. I mean, first of all, it was just absolutely brutal. I mean, when the walls were breached and the Romans came in, there was house-to-house -house fighting. Hundreds of thousands of people were killed. Tens of thousands of people were taken into slavery. The Romans, wanting to make an example of something Romans did, they would like cut, they cut down every tree in the city. They dug up every garden, history tells us. They leveled almost every building. They completely destroyed the temple. They wanted it to be a lifeless wasteland. Now, you have to understand, for the Jews, this is Jerusalem. This is their economic center. This is their cultural center. All the great works of art were in Jerusalem. The great music was composed in Jerusalem. It was performed in Jerusalem. Read in Ezra of the great choir performances that were in Jerusalem. This city just is no more. Politically, they had promised that they were promised a king that would reign forever. And they, they imagined that being in Jerusalem. This is where all the monuments were. This is where David, this is the city of David, the city of Solomon. And spiritually, this is liturgically the place they go on the high holy days. Mount Zion, maybe to us, it's kind of a symbol or a metaphor, but to them, it was a literal mountain. That the songs of ascent were sung while they were on ascent to the temple. So it was completely devastating to have this city just erased. I was, I was trying to think, you know, how could we, how could we relate to this event? And, you know, just imagining on one dark day if New York City, with all of its cultural and economic, you know, kind of center of gravity for our country was just completely gone. And Washington, D.C., with all of its political monuments, with its capital, and the White House was just completely gone. And then if, um, if, um, if uh, Wheaton, Illinois, with all of its sacred churches, and, no. 
it doesn't work, right? We can't, I don't think we can actually relate to like how devastating, you know, we've been through some attacks. If you were alive in 2001, you've been through some attacks, but just how devastating this would be. So, well, I don't know that we can relate to what was coming for the disciples and for their families and their nieces and nephews. I think we can relate to the bigger point of things coming to an end. And I think this Jesus wants us to remember that there is no lasting peace in earthly things. And that we can get caught up in the, the schemes and the careers and the politics, in the hopes and dreams of this life. And those things are all going to come to an end. Heaven and earth is going to pass away, but his words will never pass away. And I think when we avoid this truth, when we avoid thinking about prophecy, when we avoid thinking about the end times, eschatology is the fancy word you hear in school, right? As a church, we get too caught up into this cultural moment, into our current cultural setting, into our current cultural forms. They feel like the ultimate concern. We're looking to our temples. We're not looking to our God. And I think Jesus wants people, wants his disciples to know, you're going to live through profound change. Keep your eyes on me. I am the Prince of Peace. My words will last forever. While it may feel like heaven and earth are being turned upside down, the stars, the sun, and the moon are no more, stay with me. This kingdom that's the size of a mustard seed is going to grow and is going to last and is going to endure. So I think he asks us, where are we investing our hope? Where is our hope? What are the projects that we're, we're willing to fight for? We want to grab hold of, white knuckle it, a lot of those things, a lot of the things we're maybe tempted to hope in, maybe we're not, but we're tempted to hope in a lot of things that are not going to last. But the King of Peace is not just reminding us that things are ending. I think that's the first point here. And I think something when, we, when, when I've ignored prophecy, I think I've started to lose sight of that perspective. But he's also calling attention to what is beginning. So let's go back to the text in Mark 13 and starting with verse 26. We're going to read to 31. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And he will send out his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branches become tender and it puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. In Matthew 13, 26, we've changed Old Testament prophets. There was an allusion to Daniel or Isaiah's prophecy against Babylon, but now we are looking at Daniel's prophecy of the Son of Man. It was the prophecy that Julia read, or at least in part read to us this morning. And in Daniel chapter 7, he has this vision and he envisions God as this all-powerful ancient of days with the fire coming out of his throne. It's, it's such an evocative name and such an evocative image. And in front of the ancient of days, he imagines the kingdoms of this world as ravenous, arrogant beasts fighting each other, bragging about their power, one destroying another tooth and claw. None of those beasts impress the ancient of days. Instead, it is one like a son of man who comes on the clouds into the court, into the throne room of the ancient days, who is God himself, God Almighty, the creator, the eternal. And it is son of man who is crowned with everlasting dominion, with everlasting authority. The beasts are given dominion for a time, but then they're all cast aside and the son of man's kingdom will endure. Now, just like a little technical note that has been really helpful for me, especially kind of thinking about how I've heard this passage talked about elsewhere, that in Daniel, the Son of Man coming on the clouds, where's the arrival? What's on the end of that ticket? It's the throne room of God. He's not coming on the clouds to earth. He's coming on the clouds into the presence of God. Um, so I think the ascension may be in view here. I, I know sometimes it's thought about as the promise in Acts that he will return the same way he came. But um, anyway, I'll just let you think about that and think about how this passage might have been fulfilled in the lifetime of the disciples. But the bigger point here is that God vindicates the Son of Man and he gives him victory. That He doesn't get victory by being more militarily powerful than the other nations or even out politi uh, being more you know, politically savvy than the other nations. 
He comes into the throne room of God and God gives him the victory. And I think what Christ wants his disciples to know, remember, we're three days from the crucifixion. Things are going to get dark, darker than they can probably imagine. He wants them to know, I've come to Jerusalem to die. I have not come to Jerusalem to lose. I am here to die. I'm not here to lose. He is not going to lose. The disciples were going to see him vindicated. Sure, they would beat his body. They would mangle his body. They would nail his body to a cross. But God, the ancient of days, would raise him back up to life in a glorified body. He would eat again. He would mingle with them. God would take him up into the heavens into the, in with clouds um, to reign eternally from above. He would have everlasting life. You see, he wasn't just a bigger, stronger beast. I think he wants to make that point. I'm not here to fight the scribes and the Pharisees with intellectual arguments, with theological arguments. With, I'm not going to fight the Romans with political forces or military forces. God is going to give me the victory, but I am going to reign. They aren't going to win. The Judea hierarchy is not going to win. The Romans are not going to win. I've come to die. I've not come to lose. Not only are they going to see the vindication of the resurrection and ascension, within the lifetime of the apostles, they're going to see Pentecost, this event where people from all the nations hear the gospel, respond to the gospel, where the fires that represent the presence of God that was in the tabernacle, that was in the temple in the age of Solomon, is coming upon God's new global community. God is with his people in a special and direct way. They're going to see the gospel go down to Africa, to Egypt, and Ethiopia. Remember Philip and the eunuch. They're going to see the gospel go to Syria, and it's in uh, Damascus where Christians are first called Christians, where all the great missionary journeys, at least Paul's, all begin out of Damascus. They're going to see it go further east into the remnant of the Persian Empire, into Arabia. Tradition says it goes all the way to India in the lifetime of the apostles. They're going to see it go north into Asia Minor, what we now know as Turkey, up and around the Black Sea, into the area between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, which we know as Armenia. Um, which years later would be the first country to be officially a Christian country. It's going to go west to the famous intellectual cities of, of the Greeks, the Thessalonica and Athens and Corinth. It's going to go beyond the Greeks all the way to Rome. It's going to go even beyond Rome up into Europe, all within the lifetime of the apostles. They're going to see people from all, all, the, gen, all the nations that at least they could have imagined from multiple tongues gathering, Jew, Jew and Gentile, to worship Jesus Christ to reflect on his words, to celebrate his resurrection. God is going to send his angels to the four ends of the earth to gather his elect. They're going to live to see that. You see, Christ really is the fulfillment and the completion of the Old Testament redemption. The promise to David of a Messiah, who will, of a king who will live forever, of an heir that will live forever, has come and is complete. We don't really need Jerusalem anymore. It's no longer needed. The temple, which was a way to God, is no longer needed as a, as a way to God because we have a direct way to God through Jesus. He is the completion of all the story of redemption. And so those other artifacts that were meant to point to a promised Messiah, the one who would crush the serpent's head, that is now fulfilled. It's complete. He's the winner. He's the one we're waiting for. All this other stuff is going to go away. Christ is the victor. So I want to just pause here for a minute to think, well, what does this mean for us? What does it mean that Christ came to Jerusalem to die, but not to lose? And I, I want us to think about that as we think as a church about a confident gospel witness. We want to think we just need to hold on to this truth. We need to, to let this truth kind of sink into us, that Christ has come to die, but he hasn't come to lose. He actually is the victor. He's the completion of this story. I think there's two temptations that I would want us to avoid. The first temptation is to skip the dying part and just go straight to the winning part, right? Like, let's just, let's just win. This kind of triumphalist vision of the faith where we, we kind of downplay the cross, but we just seek power and we seek authority and we seek to fix all the things and make everything right. And I think we're tempted to just become another beast, another bigger, different kind of beast who competes with all the other beasts. And that's not the way, of, the way of Christ, right? The way of Christ is I come to die and God gives me the victory. It's not about how clever we are, how strong we are. The life in Christ is to anchor our faith. But there's another temptation. And I think this is the one I feel more strongly. And it's a temptation to just focus on the dying and forget the not losing part. 
to think of Christ as a tragic figure, a, a melancholy, demure king, a king, a t- autumnal king who, you know, it's kind of like that that band we like that never quite made it, but we always kind of hold on hope that they were actually really, really good. It's just people would have would have gotten hold, like he had good ideas, and we're going to be loyal, but but he, we know it's never quite going to make it to the big time. Kind of downplay the power of Christ. The vindicated Christ here is calling to disciples, like, hey, when you see me on the cross, just know I'm going to win. I'm the only thing here that's going to last. The city's not going to last. The temple's not going to last. The Romans aren't going to last. I'm the one that's going to last. And the Christ does have the power for all the things we want. The power to give us peace. The power to give us justice. The power to give us purpose. The power to give us the abundant life. So I think as Christ is sitting down with his disciples, he wants them to know we're in an era of profound change. It's going to be painful, maybe shocking. Stick with me. You're going to see me die, but you're going to see me vindicated. It's not going to be by my power or might, but God himself is going to vindicate me. And you're going to see these signs of vindication. This temple and this city that has put me to death, you're going to see it wiped out. You're going to see the gospel spread throughout the world. You're going to see me rise in glory into the heavens. So then the question might be, well, what are, what are we supposed to do? What's left for us? So let's go back to Mark and read the last, the last section here, 32 to 37. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake. For you do not know when the time will come. It, It's like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. What I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Now, there's a few different ways to read the Olivet Discourse. I'm not going to go into all of them, but how I'm reading it is this is a pivot point in Mark, uh, in uh, chapter 13, verse 32. Before, I think we were talking about things that were going to happen primarily in the first century, although I think there's lessons for us beyond. But I think here we pivot and the horizon shifts out, and now we're talking about a a longer horizon. When he mentions that day, I think he's referencing a concept introduced in the Old Testament as the day of the Lord, also talked about in the New Testament is the day of the Lord, what our creeds talk about when they say he ascended into heaven but will descend to judge the living and the dead, a time when all uh, accounts will be set right, when every knee will bow, while every tongue will confess. I think we've kind of shifted. And note that we, we went from very confident language of this generation will not pass away to more mysterious language to a little more obscure language. So what does Christ want want us to take? What did he want his disciples to take from this? I think the first message he wants us to take is that he will not abandon us. He's going to go up to heaven. He's going to reign from heaven and he will not abandon us. He is going to come back. Well, it may seem like he's away. Keep the faith. Hold on to the kingdom teachings. The call here to stay awake, I think it It could mean a lot of things, but I think at least three things it means is, one, we are not to become distracted. We're to keep our eyes on what's eternal, on what's true. Don't become distracted with the things of this world. We're not to spend the time in numb indifference and just like, well, I guess whatever. That like Christ, we're to be agents of mercy and truth in this world while we wait for his return. We're to be his ambassadors. And we're not to be freezing in fear. We're not to be afraid. Our king is coming. He's coming with power. He has the ability to overcome whatever seems in front of us. So instead of of being fearful and freezing in fear, I think we're called to worship, worship the king. You know, trying to think about what this means, I found another pastor who uh, I think talked about this very text. He talked about preparing for the day of the Lord, and he seemed like probably a good guy. His name is St. Paul, Um, and he talks about this in 1 Thessalonians 5. The whole passage is on preparing for the day of the Lord. It talks a lot about being awake and alert. It talks about the pangs of of childbirth. There's a lot of references between Thessalonians 5 and the Olivet Discourse. So if you get a chance, it's an interesting parallel read. But I'm just going to share a couple of verses. In verse 6 of 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul writes, So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. And then going on to verse 8. 
But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. I think it's interesting, you know, kind of a common cultural trope, right, of people who are looking to the end of the world as kind of the obsessive prepper type, right? You know what I'm talking about, the people who are building bunkers and stockpiling them with weapons and armor and, you know, body armor and and machine guns and 50 cal bullets, and they're ready for the end of the world. And I think Paul, I don't know if that was an ancient trope as well, but he's kind of nodding to that and saying, be prepared, be awake, get your weapons ready, get your armor polished. So we're ready for the end. But no, it's not actual swords and shields he's talking about, right? He's talking about an armor of faith and love, a breastplate of faith and love, a helmet of salvation. You see, I think what what the preppers, what many people know is the end is when we do that final battle, that last boss, right? The big the big boss. So who are we preparing to fight? Are we preparing to fight each other? Are we preparing to fight? When I was a kid, it was always the Russians who were going to come and we had to be ready for the Russians. I think what Paul wants us to be ready for is not the enemy who can kill the body, the enemy who can take the soul. It's like our fight is not going to be a physical fight. We need to maintain an orientation to this world of faith and love. Things might get crazy. Faith, hold on to your faith in God. Hold on to the love of each other, the love of the people in this world. That's going to have us be prepared for whatever's coming at the end. That's that's what, what Christ is going to look for when he returns, holding on to those kingdom principles those Sermon on the Mount principles of faith and love. And then mostly guard your head with the hope of salvation. There's going to be people who come who want to distract you, discourage you, persuade you to give up, to abandon the hope. Put the hope of salvation on your head. We're not to hope in temples. We're not to put our hope in earthly cities. Ultimately, the one person who can provide us salvation is the Prince of Peace, the risen Lord. So it can be uncomfortable thinking about the end. I know it's not the easiest topic. It's things outside of our control, maybe outside of our understanding in some ways. But I think we need to know that things are going to come to an end, that the things we see around us that seem so permanent, so big, so urgent, they're going to come to an end. That Christ came and died, but he didn't lose. That he is the victor, and he's going to be the victor and be revealed to be the victor in the last time. And he will not abandon us, but he has given us kingdom work to hold on to represent the principles of the eternal kingdom as we await for the day when he is fully revealed in glory and power. Come, Lord Jesus. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.